Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Indira Guzman, and I'm here with the Community Language Co-op. This afternoon, the organizers of this event have made a commitment to language justice. What that means is that we want to everyone to participate and engage in the language of their heart. So for this, we're going to utilize simultaneous interpretation. In a second, we are going to turn on interpretation, and you will see a little icon on the bottom of the screen that says interpretation. Please click on that icon and select the language that you prefer to engage in. We ask everyone who's not bilingual to please select the language that they um, would like to listen in on. Uh, just so in case anybody speaks another language that you don't speak, then you'll be able to hear the live simultaneous interpretation. I am, if you're on a cell phone or a tablet, make sure that you select the three dots or the more option and you will see, you will find the interpretation settings on that. If you have any questions or any issues, please uh, feel free to send me a chat and I will help you troubleshoot. We're going to repeat this in Espanol for our Spanish speaking friends and then we'll get started. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Indira Guzmán y estoy aquí con la Community Language Co-op. Esta tarde, los organizadores de este evento han hecho un compromiso a la justicia del lenguaje. Lo que eso significa es que queremos que todos participen y escuchen en el idioma de su corazón o en el idioma en el que se sientan más cómodos. Entonces, para esto vamos a usar la interpretación simultánea. En un segundo, cuando prendan la interpretación, vamos a escuchar, vamos a ver un icono en la parte uh, de abajo de la pantalla que dice interpretación. Seleccionen ese icono y hagan clic en el idioma en el que prefieren escuchar. Si están batallando si no, o si traen su celular o una tablet, busquen la opción de más o los tres puntitos y ahí van a encontrar la función de interpretación. Si tienen preguntas o si no están encontrando esas funciones, por favor, mándenme un chat y yo les ayudo con lo que pueda. Muchas gracias. Let's go ahead and turn on interpretation. I'll do a quick sound check. If you can hear me in English, give me a thumbs up in a second. All right. Well, welcome everyone. And thank you so much, Indira, for being here and for helping us with this. I am um, Betsy Van Dusen, or excuse me, Van Dusen. Um, and um, with the Chaffee County Community Foundation. Um, I'm just thrilled that we have this program and I'm thrilled that all of you are joining us for it. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to um, Lauren Kugler with the Community Foundation of Gunnison Valley. And her Hi, adult everyone. Thank you, Betsy, and I'll echo um, your thanks. It's so great to see so many people who want to help the wonderful organizations in our two communities. My daughter agrees. So thank you so much for joining us today and for everyone who made it possible, especially today's presenters. Um, we look forward to being able to offer more resources to all of your organizations as we move forward. Um, enjoy today and we look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you. And I'll hand it over to Laurel Biederman with the Chafee County Community Foundation. Hi there, I'm Laurel Biederman with the Chafee County Community Foundation and we are so excited to have uh, the first time to partner with Community Foundation of the Gunnison Valley. And Mario and Will and Kelly have put so much work into this presentation and I know we're all going to learn a ton. Uh, we're so thrilled to see so many people have an interest in this topic. And as you enter the workshop, please type your names, uh, the name of your organization, and the county that is served by your organization into the chat box. 
Uh, Scott Krieger from Gunnison is going to keep track of the names so that we can make sure you all get a resource list, a slide deck, and a recording at the end of this workshop. Because we do have such a large turnout, um, let's cover just a few housekeeping items so that we can all hear the presentations and respect your time and stay on track with our schedule. Uh, first, we'd like to ask you all to please stay muted throughout the presentations. Uh, we're gonna take any questions that you have at the very end. Uh, so please type those questions directly into the chat box, uh, including the name of the presenter. Uh, these questions will be addressed at the end of our presentations today during a 20 minute question and answer period. And Scott is going to be keeping track of the questions. So please make sure that you do tell him which presenter uh, your question is for. Uh, we're so fortunate to have Indira from Community Language Cooperative who will be handling the translation of this program. And a big thank you to Eudelius Contreras from Lake County Build a Generation and to Susan Fishman for coordinating the Spanish translation for us today. And with that, we will jump right in. We thank you all for being here and I'll pass things off to Will Edwards. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Will Edwards. I'm an attorney here in Gunnison. Um, and my practice focuses or is, is mainly consists of um, corporate law, contract law, and nonprofit law. I've been working with the Gunnison um, Community Foundation to help a lot of local nonprofits here um, meet some of their legal needs. So um, I'm really excited today to be um, able to help some Chavy County people as well. Um, <clears throat> before I was an attorney, I was actually a firefighter. Um, mostly at Rocky Mountain National Park for five years, uh, a wildland firefighter. And so I'm pretty practical minded. Um, and today I, I really want you to sort of take away um, some practical ideas, plain English ideas about key concepts revolving around what, you know, what are your legal duties? What's, what is a duty? What are those duties? that you owe as a nonprofit board member and how to think about um, making sure you go about fulfilling the duties. So with that, uh, we will begin. And that's sort of what I just said. I did change my slides slightly. Um, so you're not gonna have exactly what you see today. That's okay. They're, they're substantively the same. What is a duty? It's a legal obligation that you owe someone else, right? Um, and which someone else has the right to enforce. And so it's something you have to do. You can get in trouble for not doing it, right? Someone can bring a lawsuit against you for not doing it, but you owe it to someone else. Um, who do you owe them to as a, a nonprofit board member? Um, well, the organization itself, you owe it to the voting members of the organization, much like a corporate director in you know, a for-profit corporation would owe duties to um, the shareholders, right? So um, <clears throat> you owe them to the general public because you're not getting that tax exempt status for nothing, right? And, the, the, um, and then who can enforce them, right? So those, those three, those top three can enforce the duties uh, or, can enforce them as well. But additionally, the other board members can enforce them. Um, other third parties in sort of specialized um, specific situations. The attorney general can enforce these duties and the IRS. And those are the really two scary ones, uh, three scary ones. Um, you, you know, these guys all look nice and cute and cuddly, but you really do not want them after you, I promise. Um, so what are these duties? You've got statutory duties. So those are duties that are found in the, um, in the laws that are enacted. Uh, there's a statutory site, I won't bore you too much with, with that. Um, and fiduciary duties, which are found in common law and, and frankly also in statute, right? Um, what are they to summarize? Loyalty, care, and good faith is how you usually see these summarized, right? 
Um, it came to my attention while I was preparing this presentation that there are some nonprofit resources out there that um, list obedience as a duty. And it's really interesting because there is no duty of obedience in Colorado. Um, and the jurisdictions that do use the duty of obedience language, um, it doesn't really mean obedience in, um, in like the, the common dictionary definition of obedience, right? Um, so be careful about where you're getting your advice. And, and that brings me to the point, what, what, is, what do these mean, right? Um, because that's my mom and dad. And don't I owe them a duty of loyalty and care and good faith? Because they're pretty good parents, um, right? I do, I would, I would say I would, but I would go in and fulfill that duty in a different way <laughs> than I would fulfill the, the duty of loyalty, care, and good faith that I owe the nonprofit that I sit on the board of, right? So the, the statutes and the case law, the case law is long, but the statute, a lot of times, it, it's pretty vague. So oh, now my slides are not advancing. Okay, okay, loyalty, care, and good faith. Um, so a board member fulfills these duties when they are informed, attentive, and taking action, right? That's the plain English way to say this. Informed, attentive, and taking action, always with the best interest of the organization in mind, right? Um, so to kind of go through these a little bit, um, you know, courts expect undivided loyalty and allegiance. So don't compete with the nonprofit. Don't put your business interests ahead of the organization and don't do business with the organization because that can all lead to a conflict where really your um, loyalty to yourself is ahead of the organization. You're not being loyal to the organization, right? Um, and a specific thing that you, you really do need to do and sort of like the one super specific thing that I want to include today is have a conflicts of interest policy and follow it. The IRS really requires that for 501c3 status. So you probably already have one, but review it, make sure you have it. If it's not there, get it in place and follow it, right? Um, care is, you know, be informed, pay attention and act. So there, that's, that's where I got, you know, cued a little bit, right? Um, but what, what's it say? It says to act with care. It's, it's totally circular. Um, a lot of the definitions you find for this stuff, um, which is okay. The care that ordinary prudent person would reasonably be expected to exercise in a similar situation. What's that mean? <laughs> it's tough. It means you don't need to be an expert, but you do want to pay, you know, pay attention, ask when you don't know, right? And maybe really think about using some experts for the stuff that you don't know. Good faith um, is also sort of this like soft language. Um, I'm not even gonna go over this because it's so, so soft. Um, we're gonna get into the more specifics here in a second, but write this down, right? You're informed, you're int attentive, and you're taking action um, with the best interest of the organization in mind. If you take something away from today, I want you to take that away. Um, Okay, so how can you ensure that you fulfill these duties? Let's get down to the, to the nitty gritty. Um, be informed about what? About the organization's mission, right? Know what your organization does um, and know what the mission statement is that um, you provided to the IRS when you, um, when you, you know, submitted your form 1023, which is what you do what you submit to ask for 501c3 status, okay? Be informed about the organization's finances, including be informed about some key financial concepts, right? And, and you know, the CPA is here to talk about that, um, but, you know, educate yourself enough that you can understand what is going on in a balance sheet, right? Um, 
in a, a cash flow statement. Um, you, you don't need to be an expert, right? But you do sort of need to understand the waters that you're swimming in, right? Be informed about the organization's assets and liabilities. You can't manage an organization without knowing what it has, what it might be liable for, right? These are financial, legal liabilities. Um, legal liability is really just another word for risk. So that's our the next point, right? What are your organization's risks? And how do you mitigate? How would you go about mitigating those risks? How would a reasonable person go about mitigating those risks, right? So a lot of times that's insurance. Also includes things like employee handbooks, um, waivers, uh, your contracts and internal policies. Um, so risk and risk mitigation is, you know, because it's all, it's all fine and dandy until something happens and, and you need to have things in place before they happen, right? Um, and I think that's, that's, a, that's another key point that maybe didn't make it into my key points, and I apologize, but uh, in corporate law and contract law and a lot of this stuff, the, the scary thing is, is like, you know, the IRS doesn't send you a letter that, you know, like on, on uh, when you file your taxes, April, um, April 16th, right? They don't send you a letter on April 16th and knock on your door if you've forgotten to file your taxes. It's like, it takes a while. And, and so it's, it's the same, these um, issues that arise with corporate governance uh, can kind of go un, un, um, unnoticed and, and not really uh, causing any problems for a long time. And that's why you as a board member need to educate yourself about what is going on, what, you know, what is going on with the finances, what um, is the mission, what are our risks? What is our performance? Um, and then along with that, the organization's governing documents. So those are the articles of incorporation um, the, and the bylaws and, you, and things like conflict of interest policies, right? And those govern how you need to go about running the organization. So, so yeah, how do you go about running the organization? So things like how many board members do you need for a quorum? How many board members should you have? Um, how often do you need, right? Um, okay, be attentive. What do you need to be attentive to? The inflow and outflow of money. It's a really easy way to get in trouble as an organization, right? Um, is, or, or any business or person. So, and the board needs to be watching that, getting updates um, from the executive director about the financial status of the organization. Your staff needs, are they taken care of? Do they have what they need to fulfill their mission? Operational drift. Operational drift is um, what happens when you start off with one plan and then you start to go a different way, right? And there's always a little bit in the affairs of, of you know, any human being, but what happens um, in some organizations, you start to get further and further and further away from what you set out to do and you don't realize it. Um, and then you look back at your, your operating documents, your, your founding documents, and you realize that you know, sort of what you've told the IRS that you do is not what you do anymore. Um, so are you serving, you know, are, you, are you still um, serving that original mission that the nonprofit started out as? Be aware about potential conflicts um, with board members. Uh, those, you know, probably don't crop up too much, but, but they can, and, and um, it's something you need to pay attention to. Be attentive to new risks, right? So if you're starting to do something else, I mean, you're starting to do new activities, you're, um, so I'm on, the, I'm on the board of Gunnison Valley Mentors, you know, and, and every now and then um, we do something like uh, have a ski day or a rafting day for the mentors and the kids, right? And that's, those are huge risks. Those are huge risks. And our insurance doesn't cover them, but we take measures when we do that. We just don't send the mentors out with kids to, you know, go do the rafting on their own. We're doing it through an organization that carries insurance and has 
um, you know, mitigates that risk, right? Be attentive to changes in the regulatory environment. So this is, um, it, it, again, it sort of depends on what you do, but, but this is the, you know, the law that sort of affects, um, you know, does the state require background checks for your employees, right? Um, tax law sort of falls under this, right? Um, and in other areas of the law, employment law, tort law, um, be aware of, of sort of the law that affects your organization and any changes in that. And that can be hard. That can be hard as a sort of um, a lay person, right? But um, if you have an attorney, uh, if you have an attorney on your board, they can maybe pay attention to it. Or if you work with an attorney, um, you know, they might push out uh, updates to you because a lot of people who work in the, you know, with specific industries all the time, um, you know, I've got like little updates that come through and things that affect a lot of my clients change, right? And I'll, I'll send an email. Um, next slide. And then take action, right? Nothing happens without action. So meet regularly. You can't, you can't pay attention if you're not meeting regularly, right? And as a, as a, you do that as a board, and if you are an individual board member, attend meetings regularly, right? Um, how often you need to meet and, uh, you know, individual board member policies are probably found in your bylaws. Um, and, and so know what those are and, and do it. And know that those are the minimum, right? Um, adopt the needed policies. If you don't have them, adopt them. If you don't have an employee handbook, think about getting one. If you don't have policies about how you handle um, you know, specific issues, right? Like kids is such like a rich, rich area because you can get, you know, you can get in so much trouble and they can get in so much trouble and there's a lot of regulation, you know. And so have policies in place so that, you, that your staff knows what to do before things happen. And, and it also protects you to show that you are taking steps to take care of those kids, right? And to take care of the kids. If you're taking care of the kids, you're taking care of the organization, right? Um, ask when you don't know. None of us are experts. I don't know that much about finance, right? Um, and I look at the I look at the balance sheet and um, all of that stuff every month. And I mean, I know what it means, but I know, um, you know, there are other board members. This is why it's great to have a diverse board, different talents on the board. I know there's some like really sharp. Um, financial minds on the board that I trust and who, but, you know, I, I'll ask them questions about what they're looking at. And if, and if you don't have any background in that sort of thing, think about, you know, brushing up on it, reading up on it. And, you know, frankly, a, a, attending trainings like this is a, is a great way to do that. Um, so seek counsel, um, seek, seek out expert advice. It, it, it's so important because uh, even with trainings like this, I'm, I'm skimming the surface, right? And um, getting an outside CPA or attorney to work with um, to help you understand some of the specifics of your organization and, and, and it's how it should meet their its duties and how the board should meet its duties is, is really something you, you need to do. Um, and then be an active board member, right? Suggest ideas, debate ideas, and, and vote on stuff. The board is the governing body of the nonprofit, right? It's like the little house of representatives uh, for, the, for the nonprofit, right? And you are, the board has the ultimate power, um, you know, that hopefully, you know, and, and sometimes it's different, new nonprofits, smaller nonprofits, you might like the board might be really running the day to day. Hopefully if you're a little bit more established, you've got an executive director and staff running the day to day, but the board has the ultimate responsibility to govern the nonprofit, right? And the board could even decide to, um, you know, fire all the staff and dissolve the nonprofit if they wanted to, right? So take, take that role seriously. And, and participate in it. Um, the whole idea of democracy and corporate boards 
is that we make better decisions in groups, right? Um, so, so do that. And then put the organization's business first, put the nonprofit's business first. And um, that's, that's just, you know, that's such an easy way um, to avoid any sort of conflict uh, with, with the organization. And that doesn't mean skip your kid's soccer game, right? Uh, it's more business business. And, and, and if you do have things like soccer games that are going to keep you from being a good board member, maybe it's not the, you know, maybe it's not the time for you to be on that board. I mean, boards meet at different times. Um, be sure that, that you actually can devote the time to being a board member that that's needed because it, it is a, a pretty big obligation. So Mario, I think you're next. Now I will stop sharing. That's great, thank you, Will. So, you know, from a, I'm not a lawyer, but I know about best practices and I realize much of what I'm gonna say is very similar to what Will just said, um, coming at it from slightly different angle. So to everybody in this group, I say to you, welcome to the wonderful world of board governance. <laughs> Nonprofits are the third leg of the community stool along with government, government and business that ensure that your communities are viable places for everybody. Your work matters so very much. So the most important thing I wanna to say to you today is thank you. But then I'm gonna say, what on earth have you gotten yourself into. So in order to carry out the legal responsibilities that Will has talked about and to steward your organization and its resources well, and to remain trusted by the people you serve, the donors, your community, there are certain best practices you need to follow. Lots of people come onto boards not sure what these are, and I hope our presentations can help you get oriented. Before I start my laundry list, I wanna point out that boards have different functions depending on the maturity of the organization. There will always be programs and governance to address no matter the size or maturity of the group, but the proportion of time you're gonna spend on these might change. An all volunteer board might expect to be directly involved in programs like packing food boxes or administration like stuffing envelopes 80% of the time and maybe governance, making sure that required documents are adopted and filed, that laws are adhered to and that the infrastructure for the future is being built about 20% of the time. And your plan will likely be a very action oriented one year work plan, but it still needs to be written down by the way. As organizations mature, these proportions change. So when the organization is at its peak of maturity, board members might expect to spend 90% or more of their time on governance and program responsibilities might mean showing up at events. Your plan is going to be a strategic plan now that forecasts your evolution, your activities and your budget needs for the next three to five years, as much as anybody can forecast for three to five years in this crazy environment right now. So the first thing I'd say is learn where your nonprofit is on its journey. This will help you know if your role is primarily a governance one or a programmatic one. Even if it's programmatic, it doesn't mean you can ignore governance. And if your organization is in one of those very delicate places, where it's changing from a program-oriented board to a governance-oriented board, your nominating committee may be the most important committee this year, for it'll be identifying the people and the skills that they need to become successful in your next phase of life. So I hope you listen to these remarks and my list with this in mind. If you're with an all-volunteer organization, you definitely need to know your legal role but don't tune out when I say executive director or mention details of gardens just because you're not there yet. Part of your job as stewards of your organization's mission and future will be about building, laying the foundation for an, ex an effective infrastructure now so that as you transition, 
the basics are in place. For example, your work plan might say by the end of 2021, we're going to have adopted these five policies. By June 2022, you're going to have adopted these five policies. By December of 2022, we'll have the funds for a part-time staff like that. So best definition of a board that I've seen is this one. Boards are stewards who steer the organization towards a sustainable future by adopting sound ethical, legal, governance, and financial policies, and by making sure the nonprofit has the resources, money, people, time, reputation, connections to advance its mission. Lots of governance junkies come up with cute mantras for a board, like the well-known three W's, which I suspect a lot of you have heard. A board member should expect to bring work and or wealth and or wisdom to a board, but I'm no different. I've worked for the state for many years, so I love acronyms and things like that. I have created, drum roll please, Mario's six A's of being a great board member. Please don't be discouraged if your nonprofit may not now have all the policies and procedures I'm gonna mention, but you can help your nonprofit gradually acquire them as your group matures. Let's talk attitude. You should have a passion for the mission, vision, and values of the organization and the good and the potential good it can do. Kind of foundational, right? You need to have a lot of times people don't think about this so much when they jump on a board. You need to have a willingness to learn about the whole the ecosystem, whether it's food security or mental health and the unique niche that your nonprofit fills in that ecosystem. Maybe there's another group in the food security sandbox that feeds toddlers better than you do. Great, support them like crazy. Don't duplicate what they do and meet occasionally as an ecosystem to make sure that there aren't people being double served and others who are not being served at all. 2022 is not the time to be territorial. You need, as Will said, a willingness to invest time and to work. You need a willingness to embrace your role as a board member. You need a willingness to understand the delicate balancing acts among staff and board roles, the spirit and the letter of the law, and letting that consciousness guide you in navigating the many very gray areas that is reality. Mario, sorry to interrupt. Sure. Uh, I, I think we all appreciate really um, seeing your face through this presentation, but if you do have slides, I don't believe your, your screen is shared okay. yet, so if you want to put those up. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Of course. And I had clicked share screen. So um, are we there? Great. Thank you. Okay, attitude. We talked about that. So what do you actually do? First of all, before you start, before your first meeting, explore the website, obtain and read the job description for board members. And if there isn't one, make it a personal goal to ensure that job descriptions are adopted this year. Read the most annual, recent annual report, the minutes of the last two previous meetings, and then at least skim the bylaws, the strategic plan, the budget, the most recent balance sheet, and the most recent budget to actual. Also before or at the start of your term, you should expect to sign a conflict of interest document and a confidentiality policy document. Some boards ask you to sign the board job description document as well. And start looking at your policies right now. 
whether they're in a policy book, a special place online, or in a single massive document that covers everything. There are good governance and ethics practices that donors and funders want to see and which let those whom you serve in your community be confident that you're ethical, efficient, and effective. So during your time in office, you should plan to attend meetings, as Will said, and schedule your calendar around these meetings. Some boards require service on a committee, attend these meetings regularly too. Read in advance the board meeting materials, come prepared to the meetings. Participate in meetings, ask for clarification, raise concerns, contribute ideas. If there aren't certain policies in place, speak up. Review the finances. Don't assume that finances are just the bailiwick of the treasurer or the finance committee just because they've got financial background, they can take care of it. It's not true. When it comes to finance, there are no bad questions. Be unafraid to ask. You approve the job description of the executive director, his or her salary and benefits. You hire that person. You ensure there's a regular evaluation for that person. You approve the raises for that person, and if necessary, if you have to, fire that person if laws are broken, policies violated, or the director fails to execute their job description or to address concerns raised in the evaluation process. You need to participate in planning. You aren't only responsible for the today, but you're also responsible for ensuring the tomorrow, that the organization is evolving and vital as you leave the board and now pass the organization on to your successor. You need to ensure that there's a policy book, policy documents or a series of policy documents, and tomorrow we'll be sending you a couple samples of the policies you should have. The policies should be <clears throat> reviewed regularly and affirmed, revised or added to, for example, these days good governance says that the non-discrimination policy, which I suspect all of you have, is not only about race, gender, disability, creed, and age, but also gender identity. And many nonprofits simply don't have that. Similarly, these days, it's almost mandatory for a nonprofit to have a statement about equity and inclusion. When our community foundation reviews the fiscal policies document that we require you to submit with your grant application, if the date the policies were adopted or affirmed isn't recent, the applicant's management score, and thus perhaps the amount of grant, will be affected. Finally, learn things about your field and about nonprofit governance, because both of them are evolving right now, maybe every day. Perhaps each board member could be responsible for reading one book, attending one webinar, researching one topic, and summarizing what you've learned for your colleagues. My next A develop and conserve your assets. And of course, we all think of money first, which is big. So you're gonna to wanna to donate an amount that's significant to you. Whatever your financial situation, significant is gonna mean something different. That's a good thing, um, but donate something significant to you. This is part of your fundraising role too, because prospective grantors wanna know that 100% of your board has donated to the organization. Otherwise, the subtext is, well, geez, if the board doesn't care enough to donate, why should I? You're gonna to wanna to participate in funding. A lot of board members freeze up at this one, but there are a lot of ways to do this. Writing notes on the annual appeal letter or making thank you calls because data shows that personal touches matter. You can open your beautiful home for an intimate fundraising event or identify people who could be donors but now aren't. Take your pals out to breakfast and tell them compelling stories about the good your organization does. Set them up for a later ask by somebody. You can accompany the executive director or the, the development director on a fundraising visit, or of course, uh, make the ask yourself. And finally, reviewing financials and your budget to make sure that planning and spending are prudent. Now we don't often think, although we need to, that people are our most important process, people are product, asset. So let's talk about developing and conserving our people. If you're the president, 
don't micromanage the executive director. This is one of the main reasons that executive directors resign. If you aren't the president, remember that the president is the point of contact between board and executive director unless the president has specifically empowered you to do something. Oh, and don't serve as the shoulder for another employee to cry on. This undermines your executive director and your president both. You want to ensure there's a personnel manual that not only lays out basic procedures, but acknowledges the well being of your employees, adequate vacation time, personal time off, maybe even mental health days that are separate from PTO. You want to do your best to make sure that your staff is paid as well as possible and see what benefits you can provide. There's this terrible sort of nonprofit trap that's easy to fall into saying, how little can we pay an executive director? That's the wrong question. Instead, what you want to do is say, what do we need in order to ensure that our great staff members stay with the organization and cherish working here? You're going to want to make sure that the staff structure is the best one for getting the job done according to the plan you've adopted. Structures change as organizations evolve. You're going to want to make sure that job descriptions real exist and are realistic for the staff, including performance goals, but the only staff person you as the board evaluate is the executive director. And finally, you're going to want to make sure there's a written job description for board members, committees, and, and officers as well that includes what they're expected to do, the scope of their work, and whom they're accountable to. And finally, a huge asset that we need to conserve and develop that we often don't think of is time, maybe the most precious commodity that we've got in 2021. You don't want to adopt a plan that's unrealistic. If you've got deliverables in your plan, it's going to require your staff to constantly work on weekends and ignore their families. If you've got fundraising goals that simply can't be met, you're setting your organization up for failure as your staff burns out because they want to do their best and the quality of their work might erode. Thoughtfully recognizing the time a plan is going to take to execute is vital. And if that big plan has to be done without dropping any of the current things, then it's your responsibility to find the funds to hire the staff or the contract personnel to carry it out. Make sure the staff has what they need to be effective and efficient, the right structure, software, equipment, space. And don't waste time with unnecessary meetings or meetings that ramble or in, are inefficient. That's a great way to dishonor your people. Serving as ambassador is vital. It's another role of yours. But whenever you're in the community, remember you wear a board hat, represent your organization positively and with warmth and excitement. Talk up the great things you do. The better your nonprofit's reputation, the more receptive donors, government, other community organizations, and prospective new board members are going to be. And what's said in the meetings stays in the meetings. You may disagree with something, or you may vote in the minority on something, but don't express a contrary view publicly. Be appropriate. The board sets policy. The director is responsible for carrying out. Signs, sounds nice and clean. It isn't, of course. But micromanaging how the executive director carries out your policy is outside the scope of your role, unless in a board meeting or privately, the director seeks your advice. It's important to remember which hat you're wearing and take off and put on those hats accordingly. Sometimes you're a governor, sometimes you're a collaborator, sometimes you're a volunteer. When you're in a board meeting, you're a governor but not outside of the board meetings. When you're in a board meeting, you're a governor. A governor is an organizational steward. It doesn't make you the director's direct boss. That's the president's job. If you're on a committee or committee chair, you're really more of a collaborator with your executive director or staff. And if you come to the office to stuff envelopes or pack food bags, you're just a volunteer like any other volunteer and subordinate to the staff person or other volunteer who's in charge. Hooray, the last A. 
So you're going to be the assessor. Constant assessment is your job too. Do you know where the, your nonprofit is in its life cycle and what that implies? Is your nonprofit playing well in the sandbox that's your particular ecosystem? Complementing, avoiding duplication, supporting, coordinating, even collaborating <clears throat> with other groups. Does your nonprofit express the impact it wants to make and track in a systematic way, whether it's making that impact? Does the president or perhaps the executive or personnel committee evaluate the executive director annually? And does the board review and approve that evaluation? Does the board have a process by which it assesses its own performance every year? There's lots of samples of that available. And finally, does the board have a process by which concerns that might surface during the self-assessment can be addressed? The self-assessment represents a great time to see if your life cycle is evolving, what skill sets the next board needs to have. Because not only are you asking, is the bus headed in the right direction, but also are the right people on the bus to get it there. Tomorrow, we're going to send you information on a great book about life cycles that you might want to take a look at. We're going to send you a link to something called Principles and Practices of Nonprofit Governance in Colorado, which is a great, short, practical go-to manual of requirements and best practices in several governance areas. A couple of sample tables of the contents of policy books and a terrific DIY fiscal policy that you can use and modify regardless of where you're at in your nonprofit life. I personally think that a couple of a lot of the challenges that nonprofits face are due to people not really knowing their roles and expectation and who needs to waste time fumbling around about that. There's too much vital mission work to be done. Once again, I thank you for the good work you do and you will do next year. And now over to Kelly Sutter to talk about money. Okay, can everyone hear? Yep. Great. So um, thanks, Mario and Will. Those were great presentations. And I'd like to echo what Mario said, which is thanks to all of you who are serving as volunteers on boards doing important work in your community. Um, so much of what you do as board members uh, would, not be would not allow the work that we do as staff members to be possible. So um, I thought I'd start out by talking about the role of the board um, from a financial perspective. And, and let me start out by saying that a lot of this will be geared toward a 501c3 organization. And based on who is showing up in the chat, some of you may not be 501c3s. Is that possible, Mario? Yeah, so some of you may not be 501c3s, but all of this is still applicable to you. Um, but when I talk about donations or responsibilities to funders, um, who are philanthropists, some of that may be less applicable to you, but everything else will still work for those of you who are not 501c3s, so although that's typically who we think of when we think of nonprofits. Um, so from a financial perspective, um, I'm going to talk a little bit, give a little more detail than Will gave about what your fiduciary responsibilities are as a board member. Um, so I, I like to think that the first one, so I'm going to go through this list, is that as a board member, you really need to lead the planning efforts, at least at a strategic level, if you're a larger organization or more mature organization, and certainly at the operational level, if you're a younger organization or an all volunteer um, organization, that you need to plan early and you plan often. You're thinking of contingencies, you're thinking about the program ideas you have about the, the work you'd like to do and making sure you have the financial resources either already committed or you know where they'll come from to, to pull off those activities. So planning is a really important role of the board when it comes to your fiduciary responsibility. And that leads to the second bullet point here, which is you really need to be objective and honest and efficient when you're planning and when you're thinking about financial decisions. So what does that look like? Well, being objective and honest means that um, you're clear about how you can raise money if you're dependent on philanthropic 
uh, donations, that you're being objective and honest about the likelihood of receiving that big foundation grant. Um, if you are an organization that relies on um, government contracts or grants, that you're objective and honest about how likely those grants are or those contracts are to continue. So you have to be brutally honest with yourself. There's a tendency because we get so excited about the work we do in nonprofits to be, um, in my experience, to be overly um, to be overly ambitious and think that we can um, find money even when we don't know where it might come from. So be objective and honest. Um, and then the third point has been made several times, but I want to stress it because and give some examples of how this can work in practice because it's not always as simple as it seems. And that is making sure that in your role as a board member, you are acting in, in a capacity that is free from conflicts of interest. And all of us here, I think, are from relatively small communities, and it's really easy for lines to get blurred between your role as um, perhaps even a consumer or stakeholder of your organization, as a board member of your organization, as someone who owns a business in the community. So these, um, these lines can get very blurred very quickly. So an example might be that um, you have... Um, you're an electrical contractor in your community, and maybe your nonprofit, you're on the board of a nonprofit who is um, going to do some work, renovation work on a building. Well, there might be a question about whether you can respond to, um, to inquiries or RF, you know, requests for proposals for contractors to do that work. And the simple and cleanest answer is that you shouldn't. But the reality is in small communities is that sometimes those conflicts are going to be unavoidable. You may be, in fact, the only contractor who can complete the project on time and on budget for the nonprofit. So what I like to remind everyone is that um, you should complete every year a conflict of interest statement that and you should, you know, affirm that you understand the conflict of interest policy and you will not um, operate with conflicts. But conflicts sometimes exist. So the IRS does not have a prohibition against all conflicts of interest. What they require is that they be disclosed and transparent. So you have to disclose them to the full board and you need to be transparent about what those conflicts are. And if conflicts are inevitable, you make sure that you have controls in place, like maybe the rest of the board approving a contract or reviewing the work or approving invoices um, before that, that work is done. Um, the fourth role is to really serve as a financial inquisitor. So if you have, um, if you have a, a wonderful and great staff, and I'm sure most of you do, it can become really easy to just trust whatever the staff says um, is good. And you know, I've run into this as a staff member at a number of nonprofits where it's just too easy for the board to assume that because I'm a CPA, because I have a lot of experience, that they can just sort of trust everything I'm putting in front of them. But you really, your role is to, you know, not to question the staff to a degree that's uncomfortable or unreasonable, but to really pose questions and make sure that they've thought through what they're reporting to you, that they've thought through all the issues. So serving as a financial inquisitor is really important, even if you feel like you have a great treasurer or a great staff who's capable of reviewing this financial information. Every one of you on the board has a, response, has a fiduciary responsibility and you cannot outsource that to the one finance person on the board or to your staff. That is your responsibility, regardless of how much financial expertise you have. So you need to make sure that your organization has a realistic and well-considered financial plan. And what does that consist of? That you understand where your resources are coming from. Are they coming from donations? And if so, what kinds of donors and how many donors? Do you understand you know, if it's contracts, which government contracts? Are they likely to continue? If it's user fees, how vulnerable are you to interruptions like the pandemic um, you know, and, and other uh, catastrophes that could happen? And that financial plan should be documented, should be written out. It doesn't have to be complicated. And then how are you spending your resources? How are you allocating those resources? How much to personnel? How much to programs? How much to overhead? And you need to ensure that that financial plan is consistent with your strategic plan. Too often I see plans where we have a very, very ambitious strategic plan, 
And then there's this financial plan that's grounded in reality and the two never meet, right? And so you have to make sure that when you're developing strategic goals and strategic plans, that your financial plan, which remember should be realistic and well-considered, supports the activities and the, the tactics and strategies that you've laid out in your strategic plan. And it's the, what are we on now? Seventh bullet point. It's your role as a board member to ensure that appropriate checks and balances are in place to prevent fraud, errors, and abuse. So um, in the accounting world, we call these internal controls. So you may hear your accountant or bookkeeper refer to those in, as internal controls. And, and what are they? They're just policies and procedures that make sure that no one has the opportunity to, um, to um to take to steal resources, misplace resources, lose resources without getting caught, right? So maybe you require two signatures on checks over a certain amount. You know, make sure that whoever is signing the checks is not also the person receiving the bank statements. If you look online, there's a lot of resources for very simple controls and checks and balances to protect your organization's resources. Um, it, one of your fiduciary's responsibilities is to make sure that your funder's requirements are managed and met. So I've seen this happen in nonprofits where maybe there's a restricted gift and the donor says, I want it to go for X. And the staff says, well, we really needed to make payroll last month. So we sort of borrowed from that money. We promise we'll pay it back in a couple of months when more money comes in. You cannot do that. You have to protect the any restrictions on funding and make sure that those funders requirements are managed and, and met. And um, I'm going to kind of skip these because we're going to talk about these more on some other slides, some of these other ones. All right, so what is a financially healthy nonprofit look like? So a financially healthy nonprofit is one in which your commitment to the financial process in your process are as important as a number. So a lot of people think if you just get reports every couple of months and you're looking at those reports and they kind of look okay, that's, that's enough. And the reality isn't, is that it isn't because you need to understand what those numbers are telling you. You need to engage with the financial process, which is budgeting, monitoring those budgets, thinking strategically about how you're using your financial resources. It's not just looking at bank statements and numbers each month. And it's your responsibility as a board to culture, cultivate a culture of financial awareness and literacy among your board and your staff. Again, it's not okay to just have the treasurer or the bookkeeper or the executive director um, have the financial awareness and literacy about the organization. I'll tell you the best way to raise more money from your donors is to make sure your director of development or your fundraisers understand how your organization works financially. I never thought I would be a fundraiser. And the reason I became one is because I realized that our donors really liked to hear about the financial situation of the organization and having someone who could explain it was really, really compelling to them and resulted in larger donations. So make sure all of your staff understand the financial situation of the organization. Um, you need to make sure that your financial goals are aligned with your strategic goals, which we talked about earlier. Again, all too often I've seen a board and the executive director create this beautiful, incredible, impressive, ambitious strategic plan that everyone's really excited about. And then they turn to the finance director or the bookkeeper or the treasurer and they say, okay, now make the financial plan and figure out how to make this all work. Those two have to be considered in tandem or you end up with what I call um, is thinking of finance and development as the ATM at the end of the hall, right? Like your finance and your development team are not the ATM at the end of the hall, that you have to keep the, the financial plan, the financial possibilities and the fundraising possibilities in mind when you're setting goals. You can't, I mean, like the easiest way to lose your director of development is to create a lots of ambitious programming goals and then go tell them they have to raise the money to find it and they weren't involved in helping us set those goals, right? Um, so that leads me to the next point, which I feel super strongly about, and you can talk to any of the staff at Rumble, and this is exactly how we do it. Budgeting is an organization-wide process. Every major program that we have at Rumble, that program director or supervisor is very, very much involved with budgeting from the first time we start talking about next year's budget all the way through budget approval. And that's important for a lot of reasons. So the fastest way to get your staff disgruntled 
is to um, allocate resources to one program director or to one team or to one department and less to another. And maybe there's a really good strategic decision for that. And you forgot to communicate that strategic decision and the rationale for that to everyone. So you've got to get buy-in to the budgeting. Um, I feel really strongly that when you're budgeting, you need a budget for surpluses. There's this idea and this myth out there that I swear, if I never do anything else in life, I'm going to bust this myth. And that is that nonprofits cannot make money. Like, I don't know who came up with that, but it's like the most persistent myth in the nonprofit sector. If you are not generating annual surpluses, which means you're spending less than you're bringing in, how in the world are you gonna ever build cash reserves, right? The most common thing I hear from nonprofits is I would love to have more cash reserves. I would love to have more cash reserves. I'm like, okay, what's your strategy for getting more cash reserves? Well, if I could only raise more money. I'm like, oh, so you're waiting for like, Prince Charming to come in the door and write a big check, but then that's going to be your reserve. Well, that like, I would love for that to happen, but that doesn't happen. So when you're budgeting budget for a surplus, right? We're going to raise a hundred thousand dollars this year in program fees or government contracts or philanthropic money. And then we're only going to spend 90 and we're going to set that $10,000 difference aside. And that'll start to build our cash reserves. Um, I hope that if anyone's learned anything in the last 18 months, it's that having three to six months of operating reserves is really what your organization should be targeting. And I know that it takes a long time to get there for a lot of organizations, but if you don't start today and you don't start thinking about how to get there, it'll never happen. Ideally, a financially healthy nonprofit will begin the fiscal year with at least a half a year's funds in the banks, right? That's that six months of operating reserves. Um, but again, that takes time to build up. So if you're not there yet, don't beat yourself up, but maybe commit to trying to get there over time. Um, and then I'll probably, I want to skip the next one and talk about diverse funding sources. So all too often, nonprofits are dependent on that one angel donor or those two angel donors or that one big government contract or one big source of program fees that um, that maybe aren't sustainable. So if your revenue sources are not diversified, you need to start thinking strategically about how you can diversify them because anything could happen to those one or two major donors, anything could happen to that government contract, even if you've had it for 25 years. So really think about what your, how you can diversify your funding sources or what your plan is if one of those sources suddenly disappears. Because I've had that happen to me, I can tell you. Um, it happens. It's not myth. And so make sure you're planning if you're overly dependent on one funding source. And that's why those reserves are helpful, right? Because they can help you carry through while you're trying to figure out how to respond to an unexpected loss. And you need to make sure that your organization has a sustainable business model, right? So again, like, like not the wing and a prayer budget, right? Like not the, okay, this is all the things we want to do. The need is great. The work is great. We have to do it. And we'll just figure out how to make the money. We'll figure out how to make it work. Please, please stop doing that and be much more realistic about what's possible and what isn't. On the flip side, don't be too conservative, right? Be realistic about what your organization can do, but challenge yourself, push yourself just a little bit. I feel like I see nonprofits at one end of the spectrum or the other. They're either way too conservative and not taking enough risks and pushing themselves enough on the, on the program side, or they're so outrageous and ambitious that they're constantly chasing yesterday's money. And both are not sustainable business models. And last, and hopefully if you don't take anything else away, it's this, finance always has a voice at the table. You don't go talk to the finance people or the treasurer after you've made a decision, bring them in. You'll find that people who are, have careers in finance or um, really deal with the numbers in your nonprofit are generally pretty strategic thinkers. So they can also be really powerful thought partners for what you're thinking about doing, but make sure finance always has a voice at the table. Um, one of the things I see is that nonprofits live and die by their budget to actual, but they don't really pay attention to what their cash cycle looks like over the course of a year. So make sure you really understand that because a lot of us are cyclical and seasonal, especially those of us who are in resort or mountain communities. So really planning what your cash um, needs, 
your cash inflows, your cash outflows are going to look like on a monthly basis and doing that on a rolling basis so that you're always looking out, you know, three to six to 12 months um, ahead of time is really, really, really important. Um, one of the things that I see a lot of nonprofits doing is when they're preparing like a 12 month cash projection, they'll just take the entire budget and divide it by 12 like every line item on the budget, right? But for how many of us, even in our personal lives, does that really reflect how we receive money or how we spend money, right? You frequently have lump in some payments like insurance costs or certain program costs or staff bonuses that are, um, that are, that don't meet that, you know, pretty 12 month cycle where it's the same amount each month. And never, ever, ever include your restricted cash as part of that cash forecast, unless those funds are actually going to be able to be used for something that you're going to be spending out of your operating budget. Because I always see, non you know, I've seen nonprofits before who are like, well, we're great. We have $250,000. I'm like, wow, you have $250,000 as unrestricted money. That's great. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. But like 200000 of that is for a building we haven't built yet. Well, don't include that 200000 in your cash projections because you can't borrow from it and you can't spend it. It's like untapped until um, the need that it was is given for. Um, so I can't stress enough the importance of having cash reserves. I stole this from someone and unfortunately I can't give them credit because I don't remember who it was, but years ago I saw this, li this line that said, no margin, no mission. And I loved that because if you don't have a surplus in your operating budget to support um, a building of cash reserves to have a little bit of um, contingency in your budget, then your mission is really in jeopardy and is threatened. So I love that. No margin, no, no mission. And as I said, the best way to generate those reserves is to um, budget for operating surpluses and really work, you know, make that one of your annual financial goals is to generate those operating surpluses. Um, a lot of people think that cash reserves are only for crises, like we saw with the pandemic last year and this year, but I feel really strongly that cash reserves are also important for opportunities that may come your way, right? So at Rumble, we've built some pretty healthy cash reserves. And just like many of your communities, housing is a huge problem here in the Valley. And we're very concerned about our ability to keep and retain staff um, you know, especially senior level staff in the coming years, well, we have a very healthy reserve and we had an opportunity to buy some land that we can put um, staff housing on. So that was an opportunity that we were able to take advantage of that really helps the organization, but it was only because we had cash reserves that we were able to pursue, pursue that. So budgeting is one of the most important things you'll be a part of, I think, as a, as a board member. So I have these eight steps for successful budgeting that, um, that I like to use, and they're just really simple. And they start with a point that I made earlier, which is get everyone involved, the board and the staff, right? And this goes, it's really about building consensus about how the organization is gonna allocate its resources, right? And I'll tell you, this is one of the best ways to, in, to really enhance the culture of your nonprofit. If the staff is involved, if the board is involved, if everyone really understands why we're making these decisions, because sometimes budgeting can involve hard decisions, you're much more likely to get buy-in, people are gonna understand them and it's a much more positive working environment. Um, so you get everyone involved, you set your big goals, you do really a high level organizational budget, the sort of a snapshot of where you think money's coming from and generally what you're gonna spend it on. And then you'd get dig into the details. I see too many people build a budget from all these tiny little pieces all the way up, start with the big picture and then fill in the details. And it's a much more effective process. And you'll be getting these slides so you can, um, you can re read these later. So then, um, the final thing is what is useful financial reporting looks like look like. So I'm a very atypical CPA in that I mean I love spreadsheets like every CPA and I love accounting software like every CPA, but I really like to understand the stories that those numbers are telling me. And so when I look at spreadsheets, when I look at financial reports, I'm thinking about the programs. I'm seeing the people involved. I'm trying to really understand what's driving the, the performance or lack of performance that I'm seeing in those numbers. And one of the ways I do that is that I really try to identify 
the key performance indicators for the organization I'm working with. So for some organizations, it's program revenue. For some, it's keeping a tight lid on expenses. For others, it's payroll expenses. For some, it's the number of tickets sold. Um, so really what you need to ask yourself is how do you find define success within your organization? And then identify key performance indicators, things you can measure, you can quantify, that will help you understand whether you're achieving that success or not. And a lot of those can be financial indicators. But then you need to make sure you're capturing data in a timely manner to look at those KPIs and to understand what's happening um, with the key performance indicators so that if you need to pivot, make a change, if things are falling behind, if maybe things are further along than you expected, that you can adjust. And when you have financial reports, you really need to think about your audience. Is this an internal audience? Do we need a lot of detail? Is it an external audience? In which case, maybe charts and graphs are a better way to tell our story. What's their level of financial literacy? Are they CPAs? Then by all means, throw the spreadsheets at them. If they're not CPAs, are there other ways we can tell the story of what's happening financially within our organization that might be more effective? Um, so when you tell your financial story, I always, I love this. Is, I use this format every time I do a financial report. Where were we? Where are we today? Where are we going? It's the simplest way to do it. And if you look at just a balance sheet at one point in time, it doesn't tell me where we were, doesn't tell me where we're going, right? So maybe I'll use a balance sheet, but then I'll give some context. Here's where we were a year ago, a quarter ago, or whatever time frame is relevant. Here's where I think we're heading. Here's what my forecast looks like, right? telling that whole story over a period of time. When you're telling your story, make it clear whether your funding sources support the program mix that you need, that you think you have. And if not, advocate for those resources, develop a strategy for developing them. As you're telling your story, think about whether you're investing in your organization's future. Are you just thinking about the next two months, three months, or even four weeks because you're just trying to get by? Or are you thinking and planning on midterm and long-term horizons? Um, are you able to keep up with your financial obligations? You know, one of the things, unfortunately, that happens in nonprofits is um, we're not planning effectively for cash or something unexpected happens, that donation doesn't show up in time. And then we, we start to dip into our reserves and we start to borrow on our line of credit. And before long, we're in this vicious cycle. So make sure you can keep up with your financial obligations. And then make sure you're wisely allocating your resources. You should be able to tell that in your story if that's what you're doing, right? Keep it all simple and pictures and stories. Can, I love pictures and stories in financial reports. Love it, love it, love it. They can be as useful as numbers. And remember what you're doing with financial reporting is you're making sure that decision makers have useful information. So make sure you're presenting it in a format that they can understand, that they can use, that stimulates discussion, that really helps the other board members fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities as well. So thanks again for um, serving on your boards. Um, there's a lot of detail I could go into with regard to um, how to prepare those financial reports and how to know whether you're, you know, looking at the bank statements and seeing if there's evidence of fraud. And so maybe that's another session someday, but hopefully this high level overview is helpful to some of you and your, in your role as board members. So thank you. Let's see, I stopped. I don't know how to sh stop sharing. So Scott, have have we got some questions that were dropped into the chat uh, during the presentations? Absolutely, we do have a few, and I'll just read through them and which presenter they are for. Um, the first one's for Will, um, and it says, "I've heard it said that individual board members can be person can be held personally liable, regardless of whether they have directors and officers insurance, if it can be shown in minutes, etc." the board hasn't been prudent in managing funds. Is this true? We can't hear you. Will you, yeah. Not yet. Yeah. 
Laurel, are you able to unmute Will? Very, looks good. Maybe while he's figuring out mutes, we'll go on to one for Kelly. Is that okay? Okay. Um, Kelly, when I was on a board, we always saw the financials for operations, which looked pretty good. We did not see statements about our line of credit or restricted funds, so didn't realize that the staff was borrowing, borrowing from them to meet payroll. Should we have expected to have seen statements about these restricted funds, or how should we have noticed that there was a problem? Yes, that's a really good question and something that I alluded to because I've seen that happen in a lot of nonprofits. So, um, the so in, in the accounting world, we use what's called we prepare what's called generally accepted accounting. Uh, we use generally accepted accounting principles to prepare statements. Unfortunately, the way those standards are drafted for nonprofits, it's really easy to like lump everything together into one balance sheet that doesn't really tell the full story of like restricted money, unrestricted money, under liabilities, what, what all of the sources of debt are. So one of the things I encourage you as board members to do is when you see a cash balance presented anywhere in bank statements on um, balance sheets, always ask, is that unrestricted or restricted cash, right? So you know those balances, like I break them out for my board, even though um, that's not always required under generally accepted accounting principles. I always know and make sure others know how much unrestricted cash we have and, and restricted cash. Now, with regard to the line of credit, your balance sheet should have shown that there was an increase in the line of credit unless, you know, on the second week of the month, they were borrowing from that line of credit and then they were paying it back by the fourth week of the month, right? And so month to month financials wouldn't have shown an increase in that line of credit. So in that case, if your organization has a line of credit, ask if it's ever being used. I mean, one way you probably would have noticed it is if there was interest expense showing up on the income statement. I mean, it's rather technical, but, um, but ask your, you know, whoever's doing your financial reports, ask them what's restricted, what's unrestricted. Are we ever using any debt to finance what we're doing? But unfortunately I have seen that happen in a number of nonprofits and it does tend to go undiscovered, which is why I brought it up. Thanks, Kelly. Will, are you good Can on you mute? Me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. The audio input changed for some reason for me. So, um, yes, you can, you can still, I mean, insurance is coming into play. Insurance covers the amount that you're liable. It doesn't absolve you from liability, right? And so that's why it's important to know things like your, your insurance limits, right? Your policy, policy limits. And, and, you know, so like I have mal malpractice and um, I'm just, I'm just a one man show and it's fine for what I do, but if I was going to handle some, you know, if I was going to handle, you know, Facebook acquiring Microsoft, like there's no way because my, my, you know, like the firm who handles that has like their malpractice insurance policy is, is, is huge, right? So understanding your policy limits, understanding the, um, insurance that you have in place is, is pretty important because that's what's going to cover you if you're found liable. The, the other thing to understand too is what, how is your insurance company going to defend you if there is a lawsuit, right? Because a lot of times, um, it, you know, the insurance will, will come in and have a lawyer who handles that because they're they're on the hook for paying if you're found liable. Um, but the arrangements for how much of that they're going to cover, who controls it, um, that will vary from policy to policy. So talk to your insurance agent about, about all of those things. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we just had one come in. It wasn't addressed to anyone specifically. So if it seems to any one of you, hop on in. Uh, what is a good limit for NPOs to have for directors? It, it's going to depend on what you do. Um, and, you know, again, like talk to your insurer because they, they should know, they should have some idea. But also, I mean, also have an idea of, of the risks that you're facing as, a, as an organization, right? Um, there's no one answer. There's no one answer for that, right? Like, um, 
I don't know, Kelly, you might. Have yeah, well, I don't know if you've seen this concept, but when I was in the art world and we were insuring artworks, um, one of the things I learned in that context was we didn't insure for the value of the entire collection that we had. I mean, that would have been hundreds of millions of dollars, but we insured to our highest probable loss. And so I don't know if it's right, but I've continued to use that kind of concept in thinking about limits, not only for DNO liability, but also our umbrella policies, our, um, our commercial and property liabilities as well. Um, and I have found that um, a good agent can be helpful in helping you understand in thinking through what a highest probable, so not the highest loss you could experience, but what's the highest probable loss. So I don't know if that's a concept you've ever used with clients, but that's- Yeah, that, that falls firmly in the actuary realm. <laughs> um, it, real quick, the one thing I want to say is I gave the, I gave some general stuff about conflicts and everything. And, and if anyone's thinking it conflicts with what Kelly said, like Kelly gave the specific, like it's, it's correct. And she's over there on my screen. So that's why. <laughs> so Will, what actually is directors and officers liability insurance? What's, what's that protect you from? Well, so that will protect you from any sort of lawsuit that would um, come after the directors or officers. So um, a breach of fiduciary duty. Um, it, a lot of times, and I mean, hopefully, you know, your organizations are, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's I mean, it's, you don't see these lawsuits every day, but, but um, I mean, if you really financially mismanage an organization as the board, for instance, um, and, and now you've got all these debts uh, that you can't pay um, and, and you did it bad enough. I mean, like if you just sort of fail as a business, you're okay. Um, but if, you, if, if you've done it poorly enough that it's, that it's sort of your fault um, or there's some fraud or, or something that happened in the organization, um, yeah, I mean, people, people can sue you for that. Um, an organization, yeah, I don't, I don't know too many cases where, where organizations where directors have been sued by the members of the, of the organization. Another thing is think about your policies, right? Because that's, yeah. a, that's another area where you could, you know, um, so like, I don't know, think about the Boy Scouts of America, right? And uh, sexual abuse lawsuits. And if, and if you work with kids, but you have like no policy to background check the people who are working with those kids or anything, I mean, that's incredibly negligent. And yeah, the people are going to sue the organization and they're probably going to sue you too. Um, also, as a rule, plaintiffs um, tend to sue everyone they can feasibly get their hands on. So even if it's a stretch and, you know, I don't blame them, um, even, even if it's a stretch and not, you know, you still have this lawsuit, right? You still might have a lawsuit. You still, still might need to defend the lawsuit. And a good insurance policy is going to cover at least some of that defense, right? Um, and so, it, yeah, it, 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 directors and officers, like I would not want to run a, a, um, an organization without directors and officers insurance. Like if, I, if, if someone asked me to be on a board and there was, that wasn't in place or, or, you know, if it's just starting, they were like, oh, we're not going to get it. Um, I would not do it. So. And, and Will, isn't it true? Like I learned this this year. I don't think it's specific to our policy um, that the DNO, our, at least our DNO policy also covers um, issues that have, um, that have run out, um, that have uh, employment law issues. Right. So we were concerned mm -hmm. that we might be sued by a former employee. We weren't. It's all good. But um, but when I was looking at our coverage, that coverage actually lived in our DNO policy, which was really okay. interesting. And it covered it not only covered the directors, um, the directors of the organization and the officers, but it also covered key employees who would have been involved in that litigation. So that was really interesting that I hadn't really paid attention to that fine print before. And that's where that policy lived. And for those of you who don't have DNO policies, they're actually quite reasonably priced compared to commercial property or liability or a lot of other policies. So don't be scared to look into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not familiar. I, I should 
pour through a couple. Um, but it, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, we still have a few more minutes. It looks like another question just came in from Holly, uh, who asks, I've recently been told that nonprofits do have to do unemployment for employees. I'd always operated on the principle that they did not. Is this correct? I, I can answer that one unless Will wants to take it. So, um, so in the state, so there's two levels of unemployment in the country, right? That employers pay into. One is federal unemployment, FUTA. And then there's also state unemployment. And Holly, you're correct that nonprofits do not have to pay federal unemployment. That's form 940 that most employers file at the end of the, of the year and pay the federal unemployment tax. So that's correct for nonprofits. And states have their own rules state by state about how nonprofits, um, so I'm not aware of a state that um, where nonprofits don't have to provide unemployment for their employees, but how states fund that can be really, really different for, for, for nonprofits versus other kinds of employers. So in Colorado, if you're a for-profit employer, so if you're an S-Corp, C-Corp, sole proprietor, um, and Colleen, and I think you were on, so you can jump into this as well, they, um, you have to pay into the state unemployment on a quarterly or a monthly or whatever basis the state determines you have to pay into that system. As a nonprofit, you can choose to self-fund for unemployment in the state of Colorado um, up to a certain limit, I think. I think maybe large nonprofits don't have that option to self-fund. And so that doesn't mean that your employees won't get unemployment. It just means you'll be charged for that unemployment when employees do actually file those claims. And so if anyone got hit in the last 18 months with state unemployment charges in Colorado related to employees who lost employment because of the pandemic, um, if you're paying attention, there was a federal, either the first or second stimulus bill actually um, agreed to pay half of those um, unemployment charges from the state for nonprofits where states allowed nonprofits to be self-funded so it wouldn't be as big as a, of a hit. So Colleen, if I misspoke, feel free to speak up, but that's my understanding of the current law. So Colleen right. says if you have less than four employees, you can self-insure. And she says not recommended and I agree with that analysis because it can be a real surprise and a really big financial hit when you, when you have to um, pay that. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions out there? I've got one for Will, but I'd love for anybody in, else in the audience to go first. So Will, my question is, are you, as a board member, what if, a couple of boards ago, or most recently, some really bad decisions were made. To what extent are you held accountable for your predecessor's decisions? So if, if you, right. it depends, right? Okay, but I'm gonna answer very generally. Um, you're gonna be, responsible for anything, responsible for taking action on anything you know about or should have known about. And the should have known about net in the law is cast pretty wide, right? So if, you know, by being a diligent board member, you would have found out about these issues, right? Asking, you know, questions about policies or, or looking at financials, you would have found out. Sorry, my dog is like begging for attention. And um, you will be charged with that knowledge, whether you actually had it or not, okay? Um, and then you would need to, uh, you know, once you knew about it, you would need to take some sort of corrective action. You would have a duty to take corrective action. So, I mean, if there's something like that hanging out in your, in your nonprofit or you think there is, I mean, I would, I would talk to an attorney about the specific situation because, um, or maybe a CPA if it's if it's tax related, right? Um, but yeah, that's I mean that's I, the the diligent thing to do then would be to talk to an expert about how you fix those things. So, thanks. All right, 
Does anyone else have any questions before we sign off here? If not, I'll turn it over to Mario again. Mario, can I interrupt for a second? Of course. You're, you're sharing our email addresses, right? Our contact information I with am. everyone? Yeah. So I was going to say, I'm, I'm really happy for people to email me directly with questions anytime. Um, and I also know, quite, I mean, I do a lot of fundraising as well. So if people have fundraising questions, happy to, to answer those. So. so here are our email addresses. And Scott, do you have an evaluation? I do. I do. I just uh, dropped it into the chat. So it is a Google form for uh, just a little survey about our training session today um, that we would love if you could fill out if you have the time. Well, we thank, thank you all, Mario and Will and Kelly, for all your sharing your wealth of experience with all of us. And we thank everyone for participating today. Uh, you will receive uh, Anyone who registered for this workshop will receive a resource list as well as a copy of the video recorded link and the PowerPoint slide deck uh, and a few other things. And we appreciate you all coming and, and thank you very much. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.